Welcome, welcome. Very proud to introduce Rulent to uh, who's the speaker for our next session. Rulent is a um, passionate uh, data management professional. He he has expertise in code generation, um, automation, model driven development. He is um, actually he's been part of our data modeling zone family for many years. He's speaking. He's spoken at previous DMZ conferences. And I'm always impressed with how he has an amazing skill for explaining concepts. I've sat in on a number of his sessions over the years, and I love the way he explains things. It brings a lot of passion to the world of data. So with that, welcome, Ruland. Great. Thanks, Steve. Okay. And, um, and of course, uh, good morning and, and you know, afternoon and everything, uh, all the data modeling enthusiasts out there, right? It's really good that we have this conference. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, it is a bit of a pity we can't meet as often as we want these days. So it's it's even more important that we have sessions such as these to keep in touch, keep catching up. So uh, I'm really, yeah, really proud to be here. And um, now I would like to start this this data vault fundamental session with a, with a question for you guys. So it's um, audience participation time straight away. Question I have is is in in your opinion. Uh, what do these things here have in common? Right? We've got playing guitar, we've got playing the piano, maybe Tetris, cooking, woodworking, chess, name it, right? Emotional intelligence, listening. What what's your what's your view? So maybe put some things in the in the chat, some ideas. I'll go. I'll go and um, and and um, at, at sort of give a bit of a couple a couple of hints, right? So these are things that I personally haven't grasped the basics of uh, of myself. Uh, according to the internet, these are quote easy to learn but hard to master unquote. And um, Google any of them. Google a list of what what are things that are easy to pick up but hard to really get right, and and you'll find some of these. And I thought it was fitting because. In my view, the same applies to, to Data Vault. And if there's one thing I hope you will take away from this session is that Data Vault may seem easy on the surface, sometimes even deceptively easy um, on, um, at, at first, uh, first view, but it still takes substantial training and experience to really develop a quality data, data solution with. So it's certainly not the proverbial silver bullet um, that it's sometimes made out to be. Um, having said that, there are aspects in its design that are, are elegant and that certainly make easier to design, develop, and maintain your own data solution. So I'm uh, Roland Vos, data warehouse specialist, as Steve said, automation enthusiast. I'm a practical guy. I like coding. I like developing. I like DevOps. Um, and I like all, all these kinds of things. And I've been working in this industry for a long time in different roles as a trainer, as a consultant. As a decision maker in the corporate world, I've been a general manager for, for for a couple of years, and now back to being software developer to do really what my hobby is. And as Christian Kahl said uh, earlier, um, you need a new hobby, which is probably true, right? A, throughout all these years, DataVault has been a consistent factor. From as early on as 2005, I've been involved with DataVault methodology. And for me personally, the driver always has been its potential for automation. So generating your table structures, generating your data logistics processes, ETL, e, uh, ELT, those kinds of things, integrating it all in DevOps, making it like super easy to to define and 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 forward engineer your solutions. Datafold really makes it easy to do so, and it, this is to this day uh, still uh, what I what I like about it. So in this session, if if you like some of the the things you see, and I will go through it rather quickly uh, because you know we only have like you know fifty minutes, right? Forty minutes if we've got some questions. Then, um, then you know go to my weblog at uh, www.rulandfoss.com, and uh, I've been writing there for for twelve years now. So there's a lot of of stuff around data vault and automation and things if you wanna wanna have a look. So these days I'm working at, at Vergence, which uh, sells the the, the Bimmel Flex uh, automation software. You may have heard of Bimmel as a language to define BI and uh, ETL in, if, especially if you've been active in the Microsoft space. 
so we uh, we work on that uh, that product and i'm uh, i'm making sure that we uh, we keep it up and make it uh, make it better but you know we're not here for that you can always contact me uh, in the chat or or anywhere we're here for data vault today now my post is that data warehouses developing data warehouses is not always easy and it's always worth being on the lookout for something that makes it simpler to work with and data vault is one of those approaches, but it's certainly not the only methodology that aims to improve data warehouse development. There are actually many flavors of data vault, depending on how you look at specific implementation details. And as a bit of a takeaway, my, my recommendation would be to not to be too hung up on some of these specific details, but to find a suitable way to implement its way of thinking, which is shared across all these flavors, if you like, right? The key messages. And that's what I want to focus on in this session uh, as data, uh, data fault fundamentals. Um, the last time I did um, a session on data fault at this, uh, as an introduction session, it was a full day. Now it's in 40 minutes. So um, certainly not enough time to go into to all the details everywhere. But again, I'll be online here and I like talking about this stuff. So please reach out uh, if there's anything. So key messages, right? Way of thinking, that's what we want. And at the same time, we need to remember that we're still developing a fully fledged data solution such as Data Warehouse. And these come with inherent complexities that we need to solve no matter what, right? However, by using Data Vault, you may be able to save some time and sometimes a lot of time by imp implementing these automation principles, these code generation, features and um, opportunities that, that Steve mentioned as well. As a technique, DataFault lends itself very well for this because it has some very clear, repeatable, well-defined patterns. You'll find that you will develop or need the same ETL process over and over again. And because of that, you can look into automating that. Uh, automating that. And there's uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of opportunity for that. Again, at the same time, we still apply the same data warehousing <laughs> concepts you're familiar with. So it's also not something completely new and you can still use your experience with third number form or corporate information factory, the, the dimensional modeling, all those things that you've learned over the years, they're still applicable and you still need them in, in data vault. So uh, with data vault, you will be able to develop your data solutions with a certain degree of flexibility that allows you to solve these problems that I keep mentioning you still need to solve in a more structured way. And on top of that, DataVault also allows for more incremental development of your systems for uh, such as that. So let's get started. Time is short. Um, there is some time for questions after these presentations. I'll, um, I'll try to keep it sort of around the, the, the 35 minutes for 40 minutes, which gives us 10 minutes for questions or you know, an additional round of coffee, to, depending on how everybody's feeling after uh, after that. So, without further ado, what is uh, what is Data Vault? And Data Vault is um, to to start throwing around some definitions. It's really officially titled the Common Foundation Integration Modeling Architecture, but everybody calls it Data Vault, right? And more definitions. It's it is a detail-oriented historical tracking and uniquely linked set of normalized tables that support one or more functional areas of the business. I refer to this as a hybrid data modeling approach because you combine things that work well from normalization and things that work well from denormalization, dimensional models, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So things that you've been using to develop arguably, you know, traditional if you want to use those kinds of, of um, of, of frames to um, uh, uh, to classify things, but traditional techniques to design your data warehouse solutions. So the keywords here are detail-oriented, historical tracking, uniquely linked and normalized, which means that we aim to get the data at the lowest available level of detail, the, the lowest available grain that we can. So we're not going to aggregate data into our data warehouse, basically. We want to capture the level of detail that's available. We want to make sure that changes that are happening in the systems that feed our solution are tracked, they're historized, right? We, we capture the changes over time. We make sure that the objects that we model, 
core business concepts, the hubs, as, well, as I'll talk about a little bit later, that we establish the relationships between those objects and we capture them in, in a business sense. We also, and lastly, we try to separate the administration of those core business concepts and the relationships between those core business concepts from the context that describes them, right? So the contextual information about a thing or about a relationship that's separate, stored separately from the thing itself or the, the identification or the definition of the thing itself, I should say. So, you know, it's not that dissimilar from other well-known data warehouse definitions such as subject-oriented and integrated, time-variant, non-volatile. Data Vault really is a technique that's geared for data warehousing. Um, a bit of history, and I'll, I'll keep it really brief, but, uh, you know, I can't talk about data fault, uh, data fault fundamentals without uh, introducing uh, Dan's uh, good work, right? And he's been at it for such a long time. Back in 2002, he published his articles on the data administration newsletter about data fault and to explain those concepts at a, at a high level. And, you know, since then that technique has evolved and standards were updated uh, specifically in 2013, where uh, data fault 2.0 was, uh, was introduced. Having said that, you know, don't focus on that too much. The reality is that there are many flavors of data fault and, and best practices around it are constantly being discussed and refined. And, you know, in my opinion, it is more important to understand the concepts and the pros and cons of, about these different implementations. Dan's website, the Data Vault Alliance website, is a really good uh, resource for that because it does have a forum where you can, can have these conversations and it does have standards that are available there that you can you know, you can see and you can use or you can criticize and, uh, and facilitate some some change there. But I think it's also important to mention there's very, you know, there's 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 many, um, what's the right word for that, <laughs> opinions on, uh, on on how to do certain things. And I think it's all equally valuable to to listen to those and to figure out what works best for your business and your teams and your uh, the results you're looking for. So, having said that, today. I'll focus on the main principles and highlight those uh, those key decisions that you uh, you need to be aware of. So, to explain why this matters, I would like to briefly go and explain my personal view of, about what it means to work with data in the first place, because this is relevant for the the mindset that you you know that 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 is. Um, well suited to work with data vault and for that i'd like to uh, bring up this visualization here which is the the tree of life there these are th different visualizations of the tree of life which is a visual uh that um attempts to explain the relationship between uh you know living things and their their ancestors and their close uh the closeness to each other based on a uh, species based on their genetic materials and their shared characteristics and, and stuff like that and i find this to be a really good analogy for about what it means to work with data. You see, for me, data is just stuff. Data is, they, they're, it's events frozen in time that have persisted in these systems that we, these computer systems that we have in our, in our organizations for us data specialists to uncover and analyze if and when we choose to do so. So in, in a way, this, this process of uncovering and analyzing data can be thought as similar to how paleontologists, for example, carefully unearth and, you know, and, and, and dust off these ancient skeletons and imprints and, and use these artifacts and bones and, and things to, to piece together what actually happened in that, you know, that the lost moment in time, right? The, the, the fog of the past, uh, something happened. We're not sure what, we have, only have these limited bits of evidence. And, you know, similarly, how biologists use the same fossil record to progressively improve their collective understanding of how everything unfolded, right? So how did we actually, how did all the species get there and 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 what's the relationship? And sometimes and quite often actually in history redrawing this whole tree of life as a result because our model or or our interpretation of things is is only as good as the information we have at a certain moment in time so when new information becomes available we 
we we we should or well we may or arguably should update these views and these models to uh, you know to to incorporate that new knowledge so if we apply it to data data itself is essentially a, in most cases a byproduct of a business process right so a business process is something that is a set of activities that has a certain uh, orchestration, a certain workflow to deliver something specific, right? A goal of sorts. And it's really just the things people do day to day in a job. And while they do that work, they produce data and the data persists as a little fossil in these uh, systems. However, if we look from today back in that, that history of, of the data that's available, without understanding the context, this data is really hard to 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 really understand the front and you know if we don't have the context we just have the data so we can do forensics we can dust off those bones and those imprints and and define hypotheses but you know it serves as well to have a bit of a, a scientific view on it almost where we we say look we we have this we may not have the full picture we may missing we may miss context so we may need to change our mind at some point, some point about what our interpretation, our model would would become. And scientists know that, right? Scientists, such as the paleontologists and the biologists, they know that new evidence may mean that you would update your understanding, and that new findings will maybe lead you towards different conclusions. So using that method over the years, a lot is being challenged, and um, a lot of new knowledge is generated to support understanding of what is real and what's being clarified. And I think, and I will get to the data vault uh, soon, but I think this is really important as a mindset for working with data in our businesses also, because when we collect all the data from all these transactional systems, these IT applications that support the business, uh, the core operational systems, there, there are many. They come in a lot of different types, designs, level of quality, consistency, reliability. And it's not even that, but they change all the time as well, right? So this means that within a certain company, the understanding of how things are meant to work, it's it's fleeting in some cases. And it's um, you, you may not have the full context when you look at information or look at the data uh, because you don't always know what how it was created. Sometimes that context is completely lost. Sometimes the process has changed, but it's not really visible in the data. The subject, uh, the subject uh, matter experts, they may be gone or they may be limited. They may not be available at all. And you know, there's on top of that, there's da there's data that's not consistently available, like gaps in the fossil record, right, or with questionable quality. And this still assumes that any sort of processes follow so it's not it's not it's not easy to work with information so there's so many reasons why it may not always be directly clear what data really means this mindset of looking at working with data as an incremental as a process to work towards an, an understanding between the modelers the developers and the, the business users that's what datafold is really good at Right, you don't need a full model of everything from the start to start developing. You can start somewhere, and you're not modeling a rigid, a fixed form where every all the data needs to be well shoehorned into. Right, it's it's not like that. You allow for a, a degree of flexibility and accept that you know this these models change over time, and I think that's. That's a very logical thing because for me as a as a as a specialist, and I've done many, many, many projects over the years, there's not a single project that I don't look back at and say that if I had known if with the information I know now, my model would be slightly different. Right? Because you work with the data, you interrogate it, you 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 look into how the systems work, you talk to people, and you piece back together that that understanding, like, okay, so I need to, you know, morph it like this, and that 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 gives me the result that people are looking for. But that's 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 knowledge, subject matter expertise that you pick up over time. Imagine that there's people working in these companies for for many years and they don't have that overview. How it is for consultants to come in and draft a model for you, right? It's uh, it's. I don't think that I don't think it's fair to assume 
it will be correct in uh, in one go. So if your whole design is built to map the data to that model, it becomes brittle and it's uh, it's hard to to make changes to. These are the problems that Datafold tries to uh, tries to solve. So I'm sure uh, yes, yeah, so <laughs> your experiences are are so are, are similar to it to an extent, right? It's um, it's it to me it's it's something that I'm still still happens every day. Like if I had known this, I would have done that. And there are various ways that Datafold supports this kind of flexibility, and and we will come to this. But the core idea is to make sure that the the business logic, the interpretation of the of the of the raw data you receive, is pushed out to the delivery of the data, the, the data mart, if you will, as late in the architecture as possible. So Datafold makes this distinction between technical rules and business rules. And technical rules are creating an audit trail, managing consistency, issuing keys, uh, setting dates, and and stuff like that. But they don't. They, it's implemented in a way that doesn't irreversibly change the data. And business rules, they are called or referred to as destructive transformations in data fault uh, context. And you know, it's like it's like aggregations and, and and sums, right? So once you apply them, the original ingredients that make that uh, calculation, they're lost, right? If I do a sum of the parts and only store the, the end result, I don't know necessarily what, to, what the, the components were. So what Datafold does is push those these structures transformations as close to the delivery as possible and make sure that the original data you receive is stored before you get to make those decisions. So I'd like to note at this stage that conceptually speaking, this approach is not at odds with having uh, like this holistic uh, integral integral data model or model of the business, right? I think that's 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 good to have and it's important and it's, it's a communication tool and it's you really want to have that. However, the, the the message here is you don't use that to develop your whole solution, your whole model, your physical model for a data warehouse from the start. Rather, you use that holistic view of how you know. <laughs> The, this model of the business of how it's supposed to work. You use it as your, your north star. So you work towards that, acknowledging that you may not even always get there because of limitations in data, in systems, in processes, but it's your it's your guide, right? That's where you want to want to be, but you're not developing your solution strictly for that. You're developing solution for change. So over time, you can build up the knowledge to, to reach that ideal state. And you may never get there, but that's, and that's fine, right? Because you will be delivering value while you do that, as opposed to spending all that effort to get there in one go and then never arrive. So that's uh, that's really the, the the mindset. And I could have said this much uh, more succinct in a few sentences. If you got a pair of eggs, you can use them, you break them, you make scrambled eggs. But if you change your mind, you can't go back and create a, a post egg, right? So there's many metaphors like this to describe the intent of, of working with data. But it all comes down to historizing the data in its original form before applying transformations. So I could have saved like 10 minutes of, uh, you know, high level conceptual conversations right there. So let's go to, uh, let's go to, um, to Datafold. So the, the building blocks of Datafold, and I will speed up a little bit because, um, there's, there's lots I want to cover, but, um, I am aware we don't have that much time either right so what is what is data fault really coming down to and in this um in this diagram you can uh, you can see that data that how it is stored in the operational systems in the source systems it's it's really classified into things relationships and descriptions context of that of those things and relationships. So what we do is we pick up that information and for every source of data, we say this data maps to that thing. This data maps to this relationship. This data describes this thing. And we are breaking up the original data set and reorganizing that in the context of the business concepts we want to, we think we want to work with and in, in the short term, our initial assumption of what the target model would be customer, product, line item, 
sale, you know, those kinds of things that are concepts, relationships, and, um, and, the, and of course the, the, the attributes, the columns are the descriptive properties around that. And then if we done that, then there's pretty well-defined algorithms to combine that into some sort of delivery in the presentation layer, which can be a star schema. It can be a flat file. It can be an API. It can be whatever you want. Perp the, the point here is that is, is reorganized into its, uh, uh, its own context, its own specific areas, and then delivered into whatever target form it needs to be. So that's, that's, that's really, uh, that's really it. So if we look at, at terminology, then, then we, um, we refer to these business concepts as hubs in data vault and a hub is the identifier of that core business concept so the customer number or the product code and stuff like that and hubs are related together as a relationship which we refer to as a link and a link entity that you know that captures that natural business relationship that is the combination of the the hub keys effectively so you know you can see it as an intersection entity of sorts you've got the thing and it relates to something else and it's always by default in a set up in a many-to-many -many, uh fashion because you never really know what's going to happen that's sort of the the short explanation of that but then you've got all these uh, contextual attributes that you can use to describe those those hubs and links which uh you know which then are re directly related to that uh hub or link table. So introducing a couple of, uh, of terms there. And in terms of what, um, what kind of information we're capturing, the core business concept, which is embodied in the hub table, it can be a person, a thing, a place, a, a concept, event. And, and here's where we go into this, uh, you know, I think about it slightly differently because my my personal view of what we call relationships and and um, and business concepts may be different, and that's fine, right? And this is why we have quite a few different opinions on 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 what to do, and it doesn't really matter because the the way we treat the information is um, is the the way we load and and manage the data going through these tables into the delivery. If we do it well, it's automated anyway. So if we change our mind and we say, look, this hub it should have been a link or I describing something about this hub and I want to split it up and be its own thing. You know, that that's exactly the kind of flexibility we're aiming for because it's not one big table where we've got foreign keys and, and attributes and primary keys in the same, same thing, right? In the same table, we've got a key table here that captures what the thing is. We've got a relationship that links it to other, other things. And we've got, information that describes this. And if you want to break that up in different constellations, that's no problem. The only thing we need to make sure is that we have the development approach to make that uh, easy, quick, and relatively painless. And that's perfectly doable. So um, I want to both apologize and um, introduce this uh, these slides here because I've been using these really bright colors, which I I'm more of a you know pastel kind of guy when it comes to presentations, but be using some really bright colors today, and that's because there is there are some conventions that are more more or less accepted in the in the community, and it's worth bringing those up. So hops are blue, links are red, satellites are yellow. Similarly, and I just wanted to let you know so you are aware there's also a, um, an iconography so there's also icons that are available for use in data fault models and some tools adopt them sometimes some tools don't these are developed by uh, by Dan and, and uh, Michael Oshinke, um from skill free so they're uh, I think they're on the github somewhere uh, they're meant to be used to to try to create a standard of and how we report in these kinds of things again I just wanted to make you aware uh, as part of an introduction to data fault that these things exist. So uh, use them um, however you want is, is probably the, the message here. So if we take all of that into consideration, so we were happy with this design to, this approach to design for change. We want to 
start somewhere and then build our uh, our solution into um you know um we start a journey to get to this into in integral holistic data model or the business model that we uh, we want to get to so how, how can you do that and and why does it why does it make sense so for that i've um created this this really quick series of projects that explain how you how you can use that and why why it, it can be helpful to think like that because if we assume in this particular slide that we've got two systems on the one hand we have this policy management system that captures you know things about customers and policies and on the other hand we've got a pricing system just quotation and it uh, creates offers and it manages risk in an insurance um context i have a bit of an insurance background so these these are the, the things that i used to work with every day um then we can fairly quickly workshop with the team that you know the core business concepts that we're interested in are customer and policy and quote and there is a relationship between them we can also say there are some descriptive information that that is available in those systems that we can use to describe the customer and describe the policy and describe the quote. So in this case, the blue um, uh, hexagons there, the the hubs, the core business concepts. The the red lines are the relationships. I didn't create the link tables as such, just to keep the the overview a little bit simple. And of course, the the yellow hexagons that that's the um, the context information. But the point here is that even with a tiny bit of data, we can already start creating value for the business, right? So we don't need a lot to talk about conversion rates. So how many people in certain uh, categories based on their personal details, the contextual data, how many people actually got an offer and then bought the product as opposed to, you know, how many people looked at the offer and then decided, no, this is not for me. And this is how data fault can work for you because you can you can cast a small net over some data sources and say I only I only want this stuff here and I'll I'll see what I can do with it. But I am using this to then continue to build on my my full uh, full architecture over time. So in here I can already see with certain uh, age brackets that some of the conversion rates are are not not great. So we can start targeting customers, uh, customer segments uh, more specifically that have those lower conversion rates. So while the business is happy, uh, happy doing that and can use use that information, we can start adding more information to the to the to the data fault model. So now we're introducing a third system, which is uh, in this made up world, it's the call, call center management system, some operations uh, application, and we add more context to the customer because we have a, an additional source of data that still talks about the customer, but then has additional information to add to the already existing descriptive uh, data that's available. Moreover, we also build another relationship from customer to call and with call details. And with that information combined with what we already have, we can start to, we can, you know, uh, create a predictive model for telemarketing, for example. Like, if I'm going to call this customer, am I going to sell something or I'm going to scare them away and uh, end up on the unsubscribe list? list? Right? You can predict those kinds of things to an extent, of course. But that's the kind of, of thinking you can do. You're adding information, and because you combine it with what's already there, you can start doing more. Lastly, we can also integrate more systems, right? In this case, the digital marketing system, and we get yet more information about the customer in a marketing event. And we can look at the information over over time and, and it, do people respond to different campaigns in different ways and, and stuff like that. So the point here is incremental creation of your data warehouse solution is something that DataVault is really good at. And if you change your mind and you want to say, look, maybe customer is not the right inf the right detail maybe i want to split it up into uh, like an insured purse party and uh, additional insured or something like that then we can start sort of refactoring that model and modeling out the subtypes of that customer what's then a super type that's perfectly doable and why and how that's what i'm going to tell talk about talk about next and um, 
you know, it's not a data modeling zone if uh, if we we don't mention Steve. And I I so wanted to put this 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 the thinking image uh, somewhere uh, from Australia. I couldn't find it. I was I was too late. I'm really sorry. Uh, would have been so much fun. But you know that doesn't uh, take away the the the, the wisdom in uh, in the quotes uh, here, at least from Steve's part, right? So a data model is a precise representation of an information landscape. And Steve always talks about you know just removing the ambiguity about what things mean and how we uh, how we document them and how we use them as communication tools, which is which is really awesome. And I'm a, I'm a big fan. Um, and I, I'd like to add to that that even though. I fully agree with that. You can have multiple correct uh, models and, and landscape for a different uh, collection, and they can even conflict. And to me, that's awesome. And I used to um, run different teams, uh, the, the analytics team and the BI teams and, and data governance team. And and there was this, there is this, this built-in friction between we want this model that describes it all right the model the one that rules them all however my view is is we that's true but we don't design our system for that we design a system for change so we can move towards that which means that if we have different departments that cannot agree about certain definition or certain ways to remove that amb ambiguity in the model and and get to a, a single conversation a single definition of something that's not my problem that's not the problem for me as a data warehouse. I, I I don't think, and this is a bit of an uh, of an you know opinionated thing to say, as they uh, sometimes call it. I think that from my perspective, and and this is what DataFault is good at, we store the facts, we store the raw data in its level of detail, and then we deploy two different views, different models as a delivery. Say to finance, your customer definition is here. For HR, your customer definition is here. If those conflict, then we can give those two conf conflicting definitions to the respective uh, departments, put them in a the door, lock it, and then you know leave them to battle it out. And the one that leaves alive gets to you know to inscribe the, the correct definition into our model, into our metadata. With that information, we say, okay, well, thank you for your business requirement. And it goes into into the design, and you refactor the definition, and end up with a step uh, it, with with a delivery model that is closer to that holistic, uh, integral enterprise data model that you you aim for. So I'm not saying it's not the right thing to do. I just say it's not it shouldn't be the goal of your data warehouse because the data warehouse facilitates those conversations. And the best thing you can do is to make sure that you can quickly act when people do change their minds. And that way you can facilitate the conversation to, to get to a better understanding of, of what data means within the business. So I think that's really important. And to, um, to, to show that, I've got a couple of architecture slides that are, are relevant uh, for this and for, for DataVault because as I said in the introduction, we still have a couple of sources, we uh, source systems, we still, deliver these 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 you know these outputs in a form that we're sort of familiar with dimensional models data marts doesn't matter that much and we're still working towards a single point of truth or the single version of the truth um svot didn't really abbreviate as good so single point of truth is just a slight slightly uh, slightly nicer i think the point is the same right it's still something we want however we don't design everything for that so what uh, what we can do is then to think about if the business wants customer, provider, salesperson, that kind of information, then we can say, look, if the source has partner data, am I going to model this as customer, provider, salesperson, like uh, subtypes, for example, or partner, right? So that's your first that's your first sort of decision, and this is where. You know the the, the structured modeling, the business modeling techniques such as Elm uh, that uh, that Hans uh, Hans Hultgren and Ramke Brookmans mentioned. Those those come in handy for that because it gives you a step in the right direction to say, this is you know based on everything we know, this is sort of the right level of detail to start working with. But then we need to define and store the data still, right? So we need to map that business model to the 
uh, to the um, to the real data. And this is where we we end up with this typical three layer architecture where we collect the data, we stage it, and um, we can opt optionally persist that data indefinitely. So we have more ability to refactor further on. An integration layer, which is the data vault, and a presentation layer, which can be anything. Now, what is important is that when we get the data into our system, we get the data in a transactional way. So we translate the data we get and we create it as transactions. What I mean by that is that if on the left-hand side you see incoming data from, you know, from whatever, whatever operational system there is, and on the right-hand side you've got your staging area, then on the first day you get information entering your system, which you just store. You say, okay, this is an insert. I got it on Monday. It's timestamped, right? Very important. Timestamped for Monday, which is today on processing. It's the low date timestamp concept in Data Vault with the key and the, 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 the uh, descriptive data. Then the next day, the source system may give you the same data. From the data warehouse point of view, that doesn't matter because it's not a change, right? So we can safely remove that if we want to. There are some different opinions on that, but by and large, we can uh, we can agree that in our data warehouse from Monday onwards, that's still the information, the information is still valid. So on Wednesday, we actually get a change, right? Because Peter is now changed to Frank, and that's an update in our system. Then on Thursday, uh, the, the again nothing nothing changes but on friday we get an update on the key and you know you may say that's no good because your source system shouldn't do that but you know source systems are a bit dodgy and you can't trust them right so we're developing our architecture to avoid that from happening so we get the information as a delete of the old key and an insert of the new key Super important, right? So this is this is the foundation of uh, of the information that we we want to capture. From there, and I'll, I'll go through this rather quickly. But this this if we store that into a staging area, then the next step is to load it into this this uh, integration layer where we do that conceptual um, definition of what our core business concepts and relationships are. So we grab the data sets on the on the left hand side in the staging area, map them to whatever our target um, entities are based on our, our modeling outputs for our initial data vault. That information gets stored in the data vault. And then ultimately, we grab that information and then report it to the different departments in the way that they uh, they want to they wanna see it. And that's really it in a nutshell. So what I think is, um, is important, um, <laughs> what I think is important is that, at, um, and I'll, I'll go through this a little bit uh, faster, is that in the architecture, we uh, we acknowledge that. So we have these, these three layers, staging, integration, presentation. And I'm not going to go into this diagram in a lot of detail. The reason I want to show this one is that within Data Vault, that, that, you know, that scrambling of the egg happens later. And I just wanted to highlight where that happens so that, that that happens from your data vault to your presentation layer largely. But I do want to point out that here at these blue boxes here is where you implement your business logic. So you've got the technical rules coming in and that's your auditing and safekeeping, making sure the data is stored in the, the right level of detail. And then we, um, we go scrambling from here to here. Right. Couple more things, a couple of definitions, and then I've got one last example, and then I've then I'll uh, I'll be open for uh, for questions, right? So it's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to go through. Um, but um, to summarize, we've got the hub, which is the the enterprise uh, wide business key. The a hub is meant to be source system agnostic. It in if you store it as a table contains the unique list of business keys. So you have a data warehouse key, a business key, which can be, you know, whatever you define it to be, the customer number, the product code, as I mentioned earlier. You timestamp it, and according to the original methodology, you store the record source as well. I put a little star in there because 
you know, adding the record source and uh, in integrating this into your process control framework. These are things that are some, sometimes disputed, but bottom line is you have a unique list of keys that you've modeled as the, the, the way a certain thing, a certain business concept is identified across the systems. That's the ideal world, right? So that's what a hub is. Then the link is the relationship between those those uh, core business concepts, and it captures the relationship at the right level of detail. So a link doesn't need to be always between two things, right? It can be three, four, five, six, whatever captures the the the, the grain of the relationship properly. And again, these are between the business concepts that are meant to be agnostic of the system, right? So we're not gonna, if we can avoid it, store too many technical ideas in there. We want to have something that identifies the product customer, uh, whatever, across the system in the same way. May not always be possible, but that's what the goal is. So we we capture this this relationship in a, in, in a system agnostic way as well. And what we get in practice in our physical model is just the list of those relationship keys. So you end up with a relationship key and then the keys of the hub as you know foreign keys, if you like, that are um, uh, creating that relationship. Depending on how you look at it, you, you probably don't enforce the foreign keys because you, you can load things in parallel if you, uh, if you don't do that and it will be eventually consistent. But again, that's one of the flavors of data vault that um, people not always agree on. But that's, everybody agrees that the hub physical structure looks a bit like this. Lastly, we've got satellites which are the, the contextual uh, information. And you can have as many as you want, right? You can have one satellite for an at, per attribute, or you can have one big one. You can split them, you can combine them. It's, it's, it's whatever makes sense. And there are some performance benefits to do to certain things in certain ways that that's all documented. But um, again, similar, same as you can have so many hubs in the link, you can have also a lots of satellites describing the hubs or links. So whatever makes sense on the, on that particular one. The only thing that you need to uh, to be mindful of is that whatever you put in that satellite describes only that specific um, hub or link and nothing else. So you don't have foreign keys and, and and stuff like that. And you you historize everything. So the as you can see in the in the the yellow uh, entity here, it has a composite key, the concept or relationship key, and the load date timestamp. And that's really it, right? That's that's what data vault is in a nutshell. So, and what I wanted to 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 end with in uh, is to to show how it all comes together. Because, like I said, we're still building a data warehouse. It's not always um, you're you're not going to escape some of the complexities that you need to uh, to to <laughs> to implement to solve these problems that you you will encounter. So, bringing it all together, these hubs and links and everything, all the stuff we talked about. That's what the last couple of slides is. So, if you will. Imagine you have a couple of tables in your staging layer, right? So the first layer of your architecture, and this data comes in, and we uh, we just store it as is with the transaction of view I've talked about, right? So insert, delete, updates, timestamps. That's your your foundation of your solution, staging layer. So data comes in there, and then um, um, you've got the data fault model. Yeah, you know, we we did a bit of modeling. We did uh, ELM, uh, all that kind of stuff. We have the business concepts. We create these these hubs, links, and satellites, and we're going to map the data to the data fault model. And there's so many interesting things happening here. And I'm going to point out a few because we don't have that much time. But for example, you can see here this staging table maps to this uh, to this hub. So we're basically saying. This, if this would be a customer hub, for example, then this there's the, the the business key that uniquely identifies the customer is is mapped here, and this would then be descriptive information for this hub. We've got the staging table here that also maps to this hub, and it creates different context. And you've got another staging table where it also maps to this hub. So you've got these three different data sources, and then you get you map them to your um, uh, to your uh, to your hub, which is an example of where your integration happens, right? So a hub in that sense is an integration point. So you get everything get it, get there, and you will um, 
have different data sources describing that same thing. So it's what in Dataful terminology would be passive integration. There's also examples where you've got two times the information mapping to the hub here, which and and two lines here, which is an example that you can use relationships to the same business concept to capture recursive structures or uh, similarities like a same as link or a, a hierarchical link and stuff like that. So there's a lot there's a lot happening in here that 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 is then captured in source of targets mappings. You can put it into your DevOps. You can start generating it, but it doesn't really get you all the way because you still need to solve complexities around transformations. Um, that's where the concept of a business data vault comes in. It's a bit of a difficult, uh, uh, well, poorly chosen term, I, I, I think, because it's, it's really just an extension on the existing models. You use the same archetypes, the same Hubflink satellites to create interpreted alternatives of information that you've just recorded. And you can use these views to enrich your data to implement business logic in a way that are non-destructive because you keep the original data in the, the, the satellites or the persistent staging that, you, uh, that you've that you set up. But you can use that to build up a more complete view to, uh, to, to go. And then you can pick up the information and, and, and use uh, point in time tables to, to solve by temporal problems to calculate what the exact business and uh, technical change was. Do I wanna look back in the, in the history? Like what was the, the state of things a year ago? Or do I want to show everything as per now? You can also combine these into bridge tables where you create performance enhancing constructs. Ultimately, you deliver it into a data mart by using whatever information is uh, is available. So that's what Data Vault is, right? In a nutshell, it's a whirlwind tour of everything Data Vault. So the mindset, the core entities, and the way you fit it into uh, what is a fairly recognizable data virus architecture. So yeah, um, want to wrap up. Um, this will be sent around to some really good resources. Talk to the people in the group. And I want to thank you and see if there's any time for questions because I am running over a little bit, I think. Steve, can you uh, enlighten me? <laughs> yes, yes. So actually, we have just about 30 seconds left. So I'm wondering if you could just answer left. one <laughs> question in 30 seconds, which is, right. what do you see as the biggest challenge getting Data Vault up to speed? Is it technical or something else and how do you overcome it and you have 30 seconds begin now yep um look it's uh, i think it's underestimated how how complicated the patterns are still at this stage specifically to to solve the problems around uh by temporal and um the the implementation of business logic i think the the focus is really on the easy stuff i think we need to get more uh, explanation on how to solve the real uh, hard stuff which uh, which I think has to be front and center in in this. If we do that, we're good. Great, great. Thank you, Rulin. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.